Welcome to Baseball by Design. I am SportsLogos.net minor league baseball correspondent Paul Caputo, broadcasting live from Southeast Asia. This is a new one. I'm at a sports bar in Luang Prabang, Laos, with Masanori Shintani. We're going to be joined later on in this episode by Shane Barclay of Japan Ball, by Ranger Amy Burnett, who is going to talk to us about Asian Tigers. And of course, Dan Simon will be here with one of his Studio Simon Stumpers. Right now, I am so pleased to be on the other side of the planet, literally from the Sunday Helmet Hall of Fame in Fort Collins, Colorado, here in Laos, with my friend Masanori Shintani, who has a lot of professional credits he is the executive director of Ecologic, which is a Japanese eco-tour business. He is a, an accomplished professional in many ways. We've been here in Laos for the better part of a week. We have met with Buddhist monks. We have taken boats up rivers. We have met with, with local indigenous communities. We have seen crafts happening. We have experienced the incredible, beautiful nature here. and. We have spent roughly half of the time that we've been here talking about baseball because Masanori Shintani, my friend Masa, is a huge fan of the Hanshin Tigers. We're going to be talking uh, about where the name comes from and all the normal things we talk about on this podcast. But right now, I, I could not resist the opportunity to speak with Masa about the 38-year championship drought that his Hanshin Tigers finally ended. Masa... Congratulations to you on your Hanshin Tigers and their championship. Thank you very much. I've been waiting for this moment. <laughs> tell me, tell me how long you've been a Hanshin Tigers fan. Once born, start from when I was baby. I'm a 55 years old now, <laughs> uh, and that's like a, a brainwashing by my family. All right. So 38 years ago, 1985 was the last time the Hanshin Tigers won the Nippon Professional Championship. Yeah. Uh, they've won the Central League more recently than that, so uh, they have they have played for it, but not won since 1985. In 1985, when they won that Central League Championship, they very famously, fans in celebration, very famously, threw a statue of Colonel Sanders yes. into the river. Tell me, you were in high school at the time, Masa, why did you personally throw a statue of Colonel Sanders into the river? Yeah, I was not the person to throw it away. <laughs> so that guy, the reason we got number one, a champion, was a boss. He was, an, he was the best player. He, you know, he did a, over 40 home runs. His name was B-A-S-S. -S. Yeah, American guy. Yeah. And he looks just like a Colonel Sanders. <laughs> And then, yeah, he got a big mustache and he's a big guy, smiling all the time, nice eyes, a friendly face. So then, we are very happy to vote for the, for the Nippon Series uh, champion. So all the Tiger Swan went to Dotonbori River and they jumped, so many people jumped, but some people didn't, I, I think that time people did not die. Oh, that's good. That yeah. time people did not die. It was so dirty <laughs> and he got sick after that. Oh, anyway, some of the stupid Tigers guys and they, they just throw the, the bus because of God. Yeah. So they threw the Colonel Sanders statue into the river in celebration mm -hmm. because their best player, an American named Boss, looked like Colonel Sanders. Uh-huh. All right. They very famously went back, the team, after you've thrown Colonel Sanders into the river, Colonel Sanders has spited the team and has said, you're never going to win a championship again. Yeah, that's a curse. That's a oh, curse. Connor, that, that's a, yeah, that's, that we call the chicken wing <laughs> curse. So Colonel Sanders cursed the Hunchin Tigers, and in order to reverse the curse, the team itself went and actually exhumed the statue from the river, put it on display at the ballpark. Yep. Oh, it's actually, it's not next to the ballpark. 
Oh. It's, uh, uh, it's, we have a one uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken close to the uh, Tigers Coaching Stadium. I just set it up, but then no legs and no hands, but anyway. Tell me about, well, tell me about growing up near the ballpark and, and being a Hanshin Tigers fan as a kid. Hanshin Tigers, Hanshin is the area. Uh, Hyogo Prefecture, Osaka, and that area is a Hanshin area. The Tigers, Tigers, the name coming from United States, I believe. I don't know why. Yeah. But. So there are no Tigers in the Hanshin area? Uh uh, no Tigers. Except no for the animal. baseball players? Uh uh. My grandfather's company, he's an iron cutting company. And um, the name was Hanshin Shokai, Hanshin Corporation. Small company. And my father is crazy about the Tigers. And every time he buy a car, new car, he changed the logo to the Tigers logo. <laughs> and first thing, first bicycle I got is a Tigers bicycle. The color is yellow, black, and Tigers logo. Yellow and black. And the first record I got it from my father was a Tigers song. Can That's, you sing the Tigers song? How does the Tigers song go? Loco, lo, shini, sa, a, so, to. Is that okay? <laughs> yeah, I that's pretty good. So forever. <laughs> but anyway, you know, if you go to school, if you are, if you, if you are not wearing a Tiger's hat, you're dead. Oh. You lost your friends and you are booed. So you have to have a Tiger's hat. If you're wearing a Tiger's thing, it's okay. You can survive in, uh, in our city. Yeah. And you know the bonsai trees, you know, bonsai trees, famous setting at the front of the houses yeah but if you set up the, the, the bonsai in front of my, your house if the tigers wins somebody's gonna take it for a, for a memory for a meaning <laughs> uh, if you set it up and if the tigers lost and they will take you know they will break it because that's a curse <laughs> so you just can't have bonsai trees uh, we yeah. just can't have bonsai things so this was because you lived so close to the ballpark mm -hmm. that your your house was in the direct path of people either celebrating a win or mourning a loss. Uh, uh, uh. Yeah. You got to see a lot of uh, Tigers games because you were very rich and had very expensive tickets. Oh, no, I was not. I was <laughs> so poor because I was high school kids. I was working a newspaper and, you know, like hour in the morning, like a bicycle and, you know, bicycle and throw the, the, oh, yeah. the, the newspaper. Yeah, I, paper was, I was very, yeah, I was very poor for that time. And I always go to the ballpark and outside and sing a song and cheers and I'm begging to get the ticket. <laughs> so you, you I don't pay. You sang your way in to baseball games. You never pay. You never bought a ticket. Maybe the one one time or two times. <laughs> so that's how you became a Tigers fan. You sent me pictures. I, I you know I was you know we we go back a long time. We have talked baseball a long time. The very first time we ever met. We exchanged your Hanshin Tigers hat for my uh -huh, Philadelphia uh -huh. Phillies hat. Here on this trip, we exchanged baseball gear again. You sent me a picture of the celebration that you and your friends were having. Not, you know, you. this was a group of friends that you have who live near your house now, which is close to Mount Fuji, which is not near the Hanshin area anymore. Yeah, yeah. And I know that you had your, your, your daughters were there. So mm -hmm. tell me about that experience 38 years after the fact of your team finally winning the championship with with me on the other side of the planet at like six in the morning, just refreshing the score because I couldn't stream it. There was no way to stream this championship game. I couldn't believe it. But uh, it was game seven of the Nippon Championship Series and you're there with friends and family. Uh, tell me about that moment, uh, the, the final pitch, the final out. Tell me about the celebration. Every day we watch all together with my friends and they are drunkards. <laughs> They're just drunkards, you know. They have to have a reason to drink, but it's, uh, the main reason is to, you know, of course, you know, we, we watch the game and then um, and cheers and dance and and hug and campai again. That's what we did. It. But every day, you know, I was so nervous. I cannot work. <laughs> just thinking, you know, you know, I was thinking. I was dreaming this moment more like 38 years but it's you know right before you know it's become a truth you know I you know I, I feel like I'm in a, a different uh, planet yeah could not believe it I 
pinch my face and <laughs> oh yeah yeah it was that was a great moment but I was happy all my kids came to uh, join this uh, this game even they are very busy for working and uh, for for uh, for entering the university test but they they are they came and they ha we hug all each other so that was a great moment and my my wife gave me a sushi for the party and <laughs> The food spread looked amazing. I was so jealous of here's everyone wearing their black and yellow Hunchin Tigers jerseys, and this food that you had out on the table just looked incredible. And that's a pray. We pray for the winning. That's why we <laughs> every day we celebrate it. <laughs> you said that you were brainwashed because uh, you know as was, was part of your your family community, uh, you know your your family experience was being Tigers fans growing up near the ballpark. And uh, now you said, you know, you, your three daughters were, were there for the, for the final out. They were there for the game. Mm -hmm. Tell me how important it is for you that your, your family carries on the tradition of rooting for the Hanshin Tigers. I have to tell you some things. It's, yeah. it's important for me is a Tigers is a bridge between my daughters and my father, my mom, and it's, it's you know, for all of us. You know, they've got daughters sometimes, you know, we don't get our loans. But now it's okay, no problem. But when you're, they are young, they, you know, they, we always fight. Yeah. Because I don't want my daughter to do good, good things, you know? That's happened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's normal. It's called being a parent. Yeah, I mean, I have to be a bit, you know, being a parent. So. Yeah. But before we sleep, my daughter said, Papa, Tigers win. <laughs> <laughs> it's always that it's that shared that shared thing, right? Like baseball thing yeah. makes baseball so beautiful. And they get uh, they only can get married with a guy who are the Tigers. Yeah, yeah. Fun. I think that's I think that's smart. Yeah, not Tigers players. They had to be a Tigers no, fan. That's, no, I don't trust a player. <laughs> they got other girlfriends. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> You know, I have to tell you my background. You know, I was I, I really loved the Mount Fuji, so I decided to move to uh, Mount Fuji area. That was my dream. To see the the Mount Fuji from my house was my dream, and I built my house, and my dream comes true. Uh, but I still really want to keep my uh, what is that uh, identity? Oh yeah. So I this, you know, I. My still my my parents are living in the Koshien Stadium, close to the Koshien Stadium. And in order to keep my identity, I just went to the ballpark sometimes to visit my father, mama, and meet my uh, my brother's family, and then go to the Coastal Stadium. And they are, you know, we are not villagers. You know, I'm living in the village. All my kids are village villagers. Only the their friends is only the 10, 20 because that's a small community. Yeah. So when they see so many people in the stadium and cheers all together. Everybody become a friend for 40, 48,000 people, yeah. 46,000 people. Oh. They're all the friends. And, and they said, Papa, this is fun. <laughs> and I bought a, a Tiger's jacket, and, and they know who's the best player for them. And they're happy. Totally, they're happy. You brought me a bunch of Hanshin Tiger stuff that I can now wear around. I can put the, the helmet Sunday that you brought me in my collection. But. I don't think there's anyone in the world who has more Tigers gear than you have. No, no, there are so many crazy people. <laughs> but you've been wearing a Tigers thing every single day on this trip. You've got the hat right now. You've had t-shirts and sweatshirts. Not that it's been cold enough to yeah, have sweatshirts yeah. people here. People gave me uh, like a Patagonia jacket and no space, all kind of, uh, because I'm doing an outdoor program. Yeah. But I don't, you know, I have to wear that when I do the guiding. But after the guiding, I don't need a Tiger t-shirt. Absolutely. I go so. back to my, uh, my, my life. <laughs> <laughs> so uh last thing i mean you are you are a, a nature ed educator you do um you do eco tours uh can, what, what can you tell me about this this tiger we're going to talk with ranger amy burnett later on in this episode but what can you tell me about the the tiger in the logo what kind of tiger is he and uh you know what's is there anything special we should know about that tiger i think it's it's uh 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 indian asian tiger okay what year were the tigers founded Hundred years ago, almost. Hundred years I ago. I think so. Let me check it. All right, we'll check. 1935. All right, so almost a century of Hanshin Tigers baseball. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Amazing. Well, I am so happy for you. I so enjoyed following the Tigers to their championship. 
I'm so happy to be here in Laos in this amazing mm -hmm. exotic location here with this warm weather and really super interesting vegetation and these amazing cultural experiences that we've had the last couple of days with these eco tour groups. But most of all, I'm happy for the time that we've had to talk baseball in person. It's been such a blast to, to, to have these conversations. So Masa, congratulations. Thank you for sharing your championship with me. It was it was such a great connection for me to, to be able to uh, to live vicariously through you as your team won a very stressful championship. I'm glad you survived. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. Next will be Philip. Your team. All right. We'll we'll celebrate the Phillies together in some other corner of the world sometime when they I win the World sure. Series. I'm sure. Massa, cheers. Cheers. Thank you Thank very you. much. Arigato. Congratulations. Bye -bye. <laughs> Go Tigers! All right, everyone. Welcome back. I'm so pleased to be joined for the first time on the Baseball by Design podcast by Shane Barclay, who is the owner of Japan Ball. Shane, how are you doing? Doing well, Paul. Thanks for having me. Glad, oh, to, man. glad to finally be on the pod. Well, it's, you know, you and I have been in, in touch a few times. And like I said, I've heard you on uh, Anna Di Tommaso's Baseball Bucket List podcast. And so, you know, I, I, I certainly feel like I, I know something about uh, what, what you do and who you are and excited to, to chat with you about baseball in Japan. I've always said when I listen to Anna's podcast too that like it's going to cost me a lot of money because I keep wanting to travel internationally for for baseball <laughs> when when that happens. I know that's a a passion of yours. Can you tell me just sort of in general before we get into the Tigers, what as an American baseball fan, how would my experience be different if I went to a game in Japan uh, as compared to what I'm used to going to major league or minor league games here in the U.S. Well, there's one easy answer to that question, and that is the participation of the crowd in the game. Uh, it's more in line with, I'd say, um, a college football game for American fans or, you know, globally, like a, a soccer or football, as they say, around the world game in the way that the fans are so involved with every moment of the game. Uh, there's choreographed chants and songs and um and even you know hand movements and percussion uh so yeah that's definitely the most striking difference amongst many other that we could talk about for probably an hour on this podcast but i'll, I'll leave it at that which is definitely the biggest impression the um you know i mean the obvious question i think that a lot of americans have who you know they're you as an American baseball fan, it's easy to sort of think like, okay, Major League Baseball is the the center of the world, the baseball world. It's America's pastime. It, for Japan in particular, understanding that there's baseball all over the world, for Japan in particular, how did baseball get started there? Well, it was from, it's credited to a guy named Horace Wilson, uh, who's a teacher in Japan in the late uh, second half of the uh, 1800s, um, was opening themselves up very intentionally to more Western uh, schools of thought, influences, education, et cetera. So this teacher, Horace Wilson, came over um, and started playing baseball and teaching baseball to um, the students in Japan. And it really caught on quickly. Um, a lot about the things that we love about baseball just really jived with the Japanese culture and especially with this intention to kind of westernize the country because they were shut off for a long period of time before then, um, kind of self-isolated. And baseball was an entryway for them into kind of American culture. And so with that, you know, 1872, they just celebrated 150 years of baseball in Japan. That's almost as long a history as American baseball and certainly long enough for them to develop their own ways of doing things, both from a playing perspective and from a fan perspective perspective uh so yeah that, that's how it started and it's it's really just hasn't slowed down since then one of the things that's always sort of interested me is the fact that these japanese teams have uniforms with english language words on them and i'm wondering where that custom came from and if you ever might see teams that would actually have names in japanese in japan well at the professional level they all have it in english um and then with high school, which high school baseball is arguably, arguably as big a deal in Japan as professional, you'll definitely see 
the the uniforms have the 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 writing in kanji, the the Japanese written language, uh, which are pretty cool looking uniforms, uh, by the way. And you can see some guys like like you, Darvish or Otani or different guys like with you can look up their high school clips and uniforms. Pretty cool to see that. Um, but at the professional level, my understanding is that a lot of corporations in Japan, you know, they use the like anglicized name um, because that's makes the brand bigger in kind of, you know, beyond Japan. And as we mentioned, uh, really the, the origin of Japanese baseball started with this intention of westernizing. I will say that the first professional team was the Giants and the Giants, you know, there were so many Giants in America. Um, that was a really common baseball name. So the Giants were formed in 1934 um, to play against an American traveling team with Babe Ruth, Lou Gehrig, etc. cetera. Um, so these are basically professional players. It's Japan's first professional team. That went well when they played against the American teams. They said, let's form a league. And the next place they looked was Osaka, where the Hanshin Tigers are from. So you mentioned the 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 Giants, mm-hmm. who were founded in 1934. They have 22 Nippon Professional League championships. And then the Hanshin Tigers, who are kind of the, if the Giants are the Yankees of the, the Nippon League, then the Tigers are the Phillies, right? Like they've been around since 1935 and have only won two championships most recently this year. The first segment of this podcast, I interviewed my friend Masa, who is an enormous fan of the Hanshin Tigers. We were in a bar in Luang Prabang, Laos, which was a a surreal experience, a really fun thing. Uh, He wore a different t-shirt from the Tigers every single day. He had a sweatshirt. He had multiple hats. He brought me a bunch of gifts. I now have a jersey and some scarves and all that sort of thing. So this was an intense experience for him, mm-hmm. right? Like I know a lot of American baseball fans who who feel this deeply at their core. This was similar for for my friend Masa. From your perspective, how how deeply ingrained in in the Japanese culture is sports? Uh, you know, if you've seen it from both your perspective as a San Francisco Giants fan and, and traveling abroad, how deeply ingrained is is the sports culture in Japan? Well, I'll answer that in, in two parts. First of all, with your friend Masa, the Tigers fan, I mean, that deserves an answer in itself because their fans are definitely known as the most, definitely the most, I, I mean, to say that they're most enthusiastic maybe isn't really fair because the fans are really enthusiastic for all the teams, but they're the most demonstrative the most boisterous, uh, probably the most emotionally tortured. Um, yeah, I'd say like they are really comparable to the Red Sox in a lot of ways because they're like the rival to the main team that just lost for decades and decades. And and there's stuff about a curse as well, the curse of the Colonel of KFC. Um, so there's that overlap. But it's the, the fans where they show up, they are – kind of a little Japanese fans are known to be very uh, polite. Um, the Tigers fans are not known to be that, at least by <laughs> Japanese standards. Uh, they like to drink. They like to get rowdy. When they win, it's a big, big deal. And it's the whole city gets taken over. When they lose, uh, people are very upset. I mean, there's no rioting in, in Japan, but, you know, if whatever, you, you know, the, the emotions that lead to that are kind of similar uh, so yeah, the Tigers fans, I'm really happy for them that they won the championship. I was rooting for the Tigers just because their fans deserve it. You know, they're great fans and they're a great brand that um, is is known. I think a lot of American baseball fans tend to latch on to them because they're the lovable underdogs. They got a great historic ballpark, et cetera. So that's that. I mean, the Tigers are, are huge. Uh, they're definitely the number two team in Japan. Number two by a lot. The Giants are by far number one but uh, really passionate fans. As far as how much sports and and baseball are ingrained in Japanese culture, I mean, it's, it's, I think it's more like how I imagine America was like a hundred years ago. Um, And of course, Japan's dealing with the distractions of the modern world and maybe more kids are gravitating to maybe soccer or video games or whatever it may be, you know, they're not immune from that. But Amateur baseball in high um, in Japan is a huge deal. Still, their high school baseball tournament is a cross between uh, March Madness because of the format, the single elimination format, and I'd say the Super Bowl as far as how big of a deal it is on the national sporting scene. You know, people are TVs are on at work, 
Um, it, it's like if you're a, a hero at the Koshien tournament, that may be the best thing you ever accomplished in your life. And that is not a dig to anything else you accomplish in your life. It's a huge, huge deal. Um, guys can become heroes for what they did um, in high school. Um, it's Sumo is officially the, the national sport of Japan. And they've been doing sumo wrestling for centuries and centuries. Uh, but baseball is definitely the most popular sport. Um, the professional league has only been around since the 30s, as we talked about, and really like in its current form, not until after World War II. Um, but the high school and college baseball scene has been ingrained for 150 years. And uh, the National Athletic Heroes um, are definitely baseball players in general. I mean, there's stars in other sports and Olympic sports and whatnot. Um, but, you know, guys like Shohei Otani and Ichiro Suzuki are, are you know, princes in Japan. So as I mentioned, this is an episode about the Hanshin Tigers. This is a podcast about brands and, and nicknames. What can you tell me about the sort of the origin of the nickname Tigers? Obviously, there are not Tigers in Osaka. Uh, Masa and I talked a little bit about we think this is probably an Asian Tiger in the logo. I'm wearing the cap right now with the interlocking uh, H and T, which is a, a really terrific one with the yellow and black. Masa was anytime Masa saw something that was yellow and black, by the way, on this trip, he would say, go Tigers. <laughs> it was, you know, right. <laughs> but the, you know, the, the brand of this team, you know, maybe the team colors or the nickname or the logo, what can you tell me about any of that? Well, I, as far as the name, uh, when the Hanshin railway, uh, founded the team or was asked to found the team, uh, they picked the name due, due to their employees suggesting it. And I don't, I really don't think that there is any sort of super, you know, uh, folkloric origin story. I think that the, the Detroit Tigers at the time were a powerhouse. There's, I think Ty Cobb was playing at that time, you know, in the thirties. Um, and Detroit and Osaka had some similarities with their industrial background. Um, and they just, they liked it. I think that, probably it's important in Japan for it to be a name that is uh, easy to say um, for someone who's where English is not their first language. Um, and so, yeah, I, I won't try to, uh, to claim that I know exactly the origin of, of the colors um, and the branding, but I do know that it's iconic and it's hardly changed. Um, and when the Tigers do have a number of different uniforms, but it's, one of the more hotly debated things and they come up with you know bright different uniforms and alternate things they they have they have some pretty interesting ones like in the spring they'll play with these um cherry blossom like pink uniforms and um but they they definitely have a classic look like the ht hat you're wearing right now it kind of looks like the gate to um a uh shrine or temple i guess a shrine a shinto shrine in japan uh, which i think is no accident and um they have a tiger that that looks like um like a yellow tiger that's really cool logo that they use as well um and i think as far the giants is the most popular brand because they're the giants but the tigers are popular because of their story and their brand I'm noticing that of the 12 teams in the 12 professional teams in Japan, that eight of them are named for animals, if you count the dragons. Mm -hmm. So it, it seems like the, the the naming convention there mm -hmm. for sure is to to go with a a kind of fierce animal. Yeah, there's a huge mascot culture in Japan and just like little plush toys, stuffed animals, trinkets, etc. And you know, Japan is you know, Hello Kitty, for example, you know, it's just so iconic. Japan loves their cartoonish animals. And a lot of people who are not Japanese, that's what they love about Japan. They love the, the kind of cartoon and animation culture and, and the style of the, the art there. And so I think that the, the animal names, and I think probably has to do with that. They, in, in Japan, if you go to the team stores, there is more stuff than you could ever imagine like there's just all sorts of little stuffed animals keychains little art pieces and i think that the animals lend themselves to that and like a lot of teams have multiple mascots um 
and uh you know those are always really popular and um and they're always really goofy looking like they're never trying to be fierce or you know it's always just trying to be fun and cute so uh yeah i think that there might be something there <laughs> well, I mentioned that this is a a passion of yours. You actually lead trips through Japan Ball, not only to Japan, but uh, I know that when we started communicating about setting up this interview, you were overseas then as well. You were in Latin America, I think in the in the DR, I believe. So, can you tell me what you know what you do with Japan Ball and and how you got involved in in leading tours uh, to see baseball in other countries? Sure. Well, international baseball has always been uh, something that intrigued me. Going back to even in the when I was a little kid in the early 90s, my dad uh, bought baseball cards in Japan when he'd go on business trips there and brought them back to me. And that was my first introduction to uh, this other version of baseball where all the uniforms are different and the players style is different. So that was intriguing to me. And then uh, Hideo Nomo came over and, and of course was a sensation. And even though I'm a Giants fan, He's a Dodger that I have always liked, one of the few. Um, and uh, that kind of piqued my interest early on. And then I studied abroad in the, the Dominican Republic um, and really just tried to find a way to work in baseball and ended up working in international baseball operations for Major League Baseball. And uh, that I've just been chasing that, you know, traveling the world and seeing baseball games or experiencing baseball in different ways has just always been something I've I've been drawn to. And um, it's been a lifelong pursuit of mine. And uh, with Japan Ball, um, I started working uh, with Bob and Basie, the founder who was on your podcast. He also founded the Everett Aqua Sox. Started working with him in 2018, helping out a little bit with the tours um, because I wanted to get into that business. I wanted to leave um, my position at Major League Baseball full-time in order to kind of do my own thing and, and really just go all in on the global baseball travel aspect of things. And um, I took over in 2020 and uh, continued what Bob started, which was uh, one covering Japanese baseball in the English language, just kind of spreading the good word about how awesome Japanese baseball is, which when he started it in 1999 was a little bit more of a secret. And nowadays people know more about it, of course, and especially thanks to guys like Shohei Otani and, and so many others. Um, but he wanted to spread the word and, and make sure that there was this resource online and um, to learn about Japanese baseball. And then of course, take people to experience the Japanese baseball experience, which is phenomenal. Um, so yeah, I'm continuing that. We do tours every year um, to, co to go to the professional games in Japan. And then also we're going to spring training on in Okinawa, the island of Okinawa this year uh, in February, 2024. Um, and it's just, uh, it's the best. It's so fun. People uh, keep coming back, even though, um, you know, they maybe they've been a handful of times because it's so fun traveling with like-minded people. I've also, you know, when I started taking over um, for Bob, expanded to other countries as well, such as Korea, Dominican Republic, the Netherlands, Alaska, which isn't a country, I guess, but maybe the Alaskans want to kind of claim it's their own thing. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll ask you one last question here. One of the things that I've noticed is uh, that I'm seeing more of the food served in plastic helmets, uh, which obviously is a, a love of mine. I now have a a, a swallow's helmet, and uh, courtesy of Masa, I have a tiger's helmet. Now, when you take these trips to Japan and you go to these games, do you find that there's more of that now than there used to be, or is that has that always been there? As far as the the helmets specifically, I think that 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 is becoming a more common thing. Um, I I don't personally collect them, so I haven't really taken note of how many stadiums have them. But I have noticed that that's becoming more common. Um, and there's a lot of stuff that's unique to Japanese merch. But I think that also they are always keeping an eye on what's popular baseball wise in the US. Um, and so obviously the ice cream helmets would be that. I haven't found, you know, the equivalent of like the the super nachos in the full size helmet. You know, <laughs> that doesn't really sound very Japanese. You know, they're they're like portion control is much more of a thing than in America. So um, well, I'll let you know if, if I see that one. But 
I'm I'm told that the helmet that I have had chicken tenders served in it. So that's you know, it was it was not ice cream. Shane, this has been so much fun. I so appreciate you taking the time to to share your expertise on Japanese baseball. How can people find you and Japan Ball online? Uh, Japanball.com. Uh, sign up for our newsletter there if you want to get updates about Japanese baseball in general and also stay informed about our tours. And then uh, follow us online, um, Facebook, X, Instagram. Uh, just search for Japan Ball and you will find us on all three of those platforms. Do you have, you, do you have dates for a Japan trip yet this year? <laughs> Our general uh, calendar coming up will be, so we have Okinawa in February. That's February 21st, 28th. Still would be happy to uh, accept any last minute bookings. If anyone wants a little February Japan spring training escape, uh, which I will say, Okinawa spring training is kind of like how the Cactus League or Grapefruit League would have been, you know, 30, 40 years ago. When Sounds it, amazing. Yeah, exactly. Um, and then in uh, July, we're going to the Netherlands, the Honkball Week. Honkball is baseball in Dutch. They have an amazing international tournament um, with national teams there every summer. So we'll be going there. And then uh, uh, dates are not confirmed yet, but we'll do Japan and Korea around August, September. And then back to the Dominican Republic in November. Amazing. Shane, thank you so much. This has been a blast. Thanks, Paul. Really appreciate it. This was fun. All right, everyone. Welcome back. I'm so pleased to be joined on the podcast by regular contributor, Baseball by Designs, wildlife correspondent, Ranger Amy Burnett. Ranger, Amy, how are you doing? I'm great. <laughs> okay, here we go. <laughs> yeah, that's how it's going to go. All right, all right, all right. Bad jokes are starting already. We are talking about the Hanshin Tigers. We were looking at the logo when Masa and I were in Laos. We were looking at the logo and we decided it was most likely an Asian tiger. So let's start with that. What are the differentiations between Asian tigers and other tigers? Well, there are, that's a good question because there are several different subspecies of tigers. Okay. Um, the most familiar types of tigers <laughs> are the ones that are in your house, the one yeah. that just meowed. That was pretty cute. Um, the Indo-Chinese, <laughs> the Bengal tiger, the Sumatran tiger. And the Malayan tiger um, and the Siberian or Amur tiger. So the ones that that you might find in Thailand are the Indo-Chinese tigers and the Bengal tigers are pretty close to that. What about Japan? What are we finding in Japan? In Japan, you will find the Malayan tiger. So it's funny. So when you think of tiger, do you think of something with, that's really shaggy or kind of sleek looking? I think sleek, but they have like shaggy hair underneath. So their different subspecies are differently adapted. Oh. So remember we were talking about the different kinds of beer? Yes. So real quickly, what kind of beer can you find in Laos? It's mostly lager. Right. It's beer lao. It's there's one beer. It's called beer lao. There's beer lao dark, which is essentially beer lao with a darker label. And then there is uh beer lao gold, which is also beer lao. <laughs> Okay, so basically light beers, right? Yes. Because when you're in Laos or in Thailand, you want something light. So the tigers are basically adapted the same way as people drinking beer. Yeah. But just over thousands and thousands of years. So the Laotian tigers or Lao tigers, as I imagine they would be called, are the ones with the really short coats, sleek coats, and not such the not the furry coats that you're like the Siberian, what we used to call the Siberian tigers. So okay. these tiger, the tigers that you'd find in Thailand are the short coated version, a different subspecies that is adapted to living in the hot areas, and they have the really short coat. Okay, so if my if if Masa and I had gotten mauled by a tiger while we were at the sports bar <laughs> recording the earlier segment on this episode, it would have been one with real short hair. Short hair, Indo-Chinese tiger tech subspecies of tiger. Okay. Yeah. So if the if the the main difference between these subspecies of tigers is like the the hair length mm -hmm. in the major league baseball context, the the Detroit Tigers, you know, they're more likely to have like the long shaggy hair. What's that gonna be? Who's the longest, shaggiest haired? The, those are the Amur tigers. Right. They used to be called the Siberian tigers. 
So the 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 Detroit Tigers are most likely to be that. Whereas the yeah. New York Yankees, with all of their facial hair policies, are more likely to be like the, the Malayan, like the, the Malayan real... or Indo Chinese Tigers. Yes. Yeah, yeah, the real short. So shortness. they're more yeah adapted to the sh the warmer weather. Okay. Yeah. So all Tigers right. in the same way are adapted. You can have it either their shaggy fur coat or the sleeker coat, depending on your subspecies. Can I tell a cute story? Yes. Um, at the Smithsonian Zoo in Washington D.C., where they get some snow. They had a very brand new tiger. His name was Midas. Yeah. Uh, spelled differently, but sounded like King Midas. Uh -huh. And they said the first day they let him out in the new enclosure, they expected him. It was snowing and they expected him to go right back in. But because he was a um, a Siberian, a mer tiger from, from the Russian geographic area, he had a bigger coat. And so he went outside and he's, they thought he would go right back in where it was warm. And he ran outside in the snow and he was like playing in it and rolling and he jumped in the moat and went for a swim and then he got out of the water and he did zoomies. <laughs> zoomies. <laughs> like, your, like your cat at home. And I thought that was really great. So some tigers love the cold and they're really good swimmers too. Um, all tigers actually are pretty good swimmers. This is adorable, right? The tiger having the zoomies swimming around. Tigers are adorable and uh, would make a great pet, don't you think? Mm, probably not. Probably not. Okay, that was a setup. That, that is what we call a setup. <laughs> for a, an amazing uh, connection that you yourself have to actual tigers. What is that? So when I first started my last job, the first week on the job, I was brought into the office and um, told in confidence that we were working on a tiger case and that I would probably be on the news about it. And sure enough, I was. In the Phoenix area, some drug lord, which we didn't reveal on TV, but um, this not so great guy decided to adopt or buy two tigers, a white tiger and a um, and a regular orange tiger cub, and had them in his backyard. So I don't know what it is about people who the, who are like drug lords. They love having like these. I think it's the machismo thing. Yeah. Like they love having tigers because they're like, yeah, I have a tiger. I think most baseball by design listeners have tigers. I mean, you're you're describing the machismo you're describing. Really, I think hits on the that that logo enthusiast community for sure yeah for sure so um if you're thinking about those of you listening and you're like i want a tiger as a pet because that would be awesome yeah. yeah probably not a good idea i mean for one thing it's illegal in most states yeah but they just make horrible pets and so these tigers were confiscated and i got to be on tv about it on the local news and that was a lot of fun but stick to pot pellied pigs if you're uh if yeah. you're a hipster looking for a pet if you have if you're if you're doing drugs, you might not want to get tigers in the backyard that might draw some attention. So that was kind of fun. And that was in 2013. And then in 2022, there was another guy who decided to buy a tiger because he thought it was cool for yeah. $8,000 off of some dude in Arizona. And uh, then he tried to sell it um, and ended up selling it to undercover cops for $20,000 nice. in Phoenix. And he got busted. So that was kind of a fun thing that I got to be on TV for as well. The reason they're really cool mascots for a team is that they are strong, ferocious, vicious. They're pretty much top predators. Like tigers are the top, they are the largest big cat in the world. They are, can I say badass? On yeah, your, yeah, you can. On your, on your show. Yeah, uh -huh. You know, that of all the, the big cats, they're the ones that you don't want to meet in a dark alley. And in fact, a lot of people who have had them for pet, for. Had them for pets. That's what you just told us not to do. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, a lot of times when people have them as pets, um, they're mauled, injured, or even killed. There was a 52-year-old woman recently who was killed in uh, Minnesota. She had one as a pet, and uh, that didn't go so well. Yeah. So don't turn your back on a tiger, uh, uh, animal, or baseball player. Yeah. So the – oh, I got to play for you a really funny, uh, a really cute sound, actually. Okay. So the, the confiscated tiger cub – there's a video that went that went viral online of um, the little tiger cub. You want to see it? I do. All right, hold on. Uh, here we go. Everybody saw that video online and they immediately wanted one. Not a good idea to have them as pets. They get big and they eat a lot of food. Oh, true of children as well. This brings me to another point um, a compare of comparison between. Um, tigers and major league baseball players um how many pounds a day do you think the average tiger would eat of meat 10 well you're, you're about half right so 20 about 20 pounds on average a day wow. what is the large uh, the most amount of meat that a tiger can eat in one sitting all right having so just gone big. to a buffet last night i'm trying to i'm trying to think big about this here 
So yeah. it, was, it was actually reminded me of us going to Cincinnati's last night. I saw how much you could put away, and that was a lot. So uh, <laughs> you, it looked a little bit like a tiger last night. All right. Uh, thank you. I would say 30 pounds. 80 pounds. What? Come so on. so usually they don't eat that much in one sitting, but a tiger, um, they, they recorded a tiger eating 80 pounds of meat in one sitting in one night because he was basically storing up. Not unlike a minor league baseball player that might just sit down at a buffet and be like, this is all free. Okay. With, and then eat all the food. With the with the mantra that you must bring to a buffet, it's not all you care to eat. It's all you, you can, can eat. eat. <laughs> uh, and speaking of uh, feats of uh, oh. of uh, athleticism, I oh. guess eating is one of those. Yeah. Um, how, uh, if you were a tiger uh, keeper and you wanted to create uh, and you wanted to put up a fence to make sure that tigers don't get out, how high would you make that fence? I thought this was going to be a question about feet. Um, well, it is. How many feet do you need? <laughs> high do you need? All right, to there you go. Very good. nicely done. <laughs> make your fence. I would say uh, 30 feet high. Wow, that's really overshooting it. Oh, sorry. Well, uh, the they're saying about 16 and a half feet is what you should have if you have a tiger uh, as far as making sure your tiger doesn't get out. So the San Francisco Zoo had a 12 and a half foot fence. Okay, so the Amur tiger is the largest tiger and they can get up to 660 pounds. Whoa. Now, so they can jump pretty high. They're a large cat. Um, those are the ones that you'd find in like Russia, Siberia, the, the Russian tiger subspecies so in the san francisco zoo they had the one of these huge tigers and uh, one decided to get out one night it was right after the um the zoo closed and there were three teenagers that were taunting the tiger don't ever taunt the tiger mm -hmm. bad idea mm -hmm. throwing rocks throwing sticks um they the news didn't point out that these three were also high on on pot while they were taunting this tiger oh. and the tiger her name was tatiana was yeah. a good name for a russian tiger don't sure. you think yeah she decided to jump the, the 12 and a half foot fence. She got out and she mauled and mauled two of the kids, killing one of them, killed a 17 year old. And they didn't respond right away because the zoo had just closed. Once they locked down because the tiger was loose, then the cops couldn't get in because it was a lockdown. <laughs> anyway. It's got real dark. Uh, yeah, good idea not to own a tiger. They're really, uh, they're crazy top predators and they're amazing. So if you are one of the hunting tigers, I would say that you're, no one can beat you, right? That's a pretty awesome name for a, a team. This year, nobody could beat them. They are the 2023 Nippon Professional Champions for the second time ever, as, as has been discussed on this episode. Ranger Amy, thank you so much for coming by. Uh, one last question as a, as a naturalist, as our wildlife correspondent. What did the Indo-Chinese tiger say to the Russian tiger? What did he say? What's the hurry? <laughs> Wait too long to get it. <laughs> Bye, everybody. That's awful. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> All right, everyone. Welcome back. It is time once again for Studio Simon Stumpers with designer extraordinaire Dan Simon. Good morning, Dan. How are you doing? I am fantastic. So obviously a lot has been discussed previously in this episode about professional baseball in Japan uh, and a, a number of former major leaguers and future major leaguers have played or would play in, in Japan. Those include Cecil Fielder, who played in 1989 for the subject of this episode, the Hunchin Tigers. Um, Alfonso Soriano, 1997, played for the Hiroshima Carp or Hiroshima, whichever way that's correctly. I'm big on correct pronunciations, but don't know. I never seem to know what is the correct pronunciation. Um, Gabe Kapler, former manager of your beloved Philadelphia Phillies, played for the 2005 Yomiuri Giants. Mm. Um, Adam Jones, uh, known best for his long and successful career, mostly as an outfielder with the Baltimore Orioles, played with the 2020 and 2021 Oryx Buffalo, mm. Buffaloes, plural, not yeah. bisons, but Buffaloes. <laughs> That's just to name a few. There are, there are many more. And with all of that in mind, this 
studio Simon Stumper asks, two major league baseball hall of famers played baseball in professional baseball in Japan. Which of these three hall of famers did not play in Japan? Two truths and a lie. Okay. Is it A, Tony Perez, B, Larry Doby, or C, Goose Gossage? Kind of a disparate group there. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So you've got Larry Doby was the second ever black player to play in the major leagues, the first American leaguer. He and Satchel Page were the first black players to win the World Series with Cleveland back in the day. And I know that there was a, a substantial amount of uh, barnstorming that happened in Japan. Like the Negro Leagues players actually went over and played in Japan, not necessarily with Japanese teams. Can I ask for that clarification? Is it a question of they played actually with Japanese teams, like one of the 12 teams in the Nippon Professional Leagues? Or was it actually, could it have been... Uh, I don't know if this is giving away the answer here, but could it have counted uh, playing as part of a traveling team, an American traveling team that was over there? The former. They played for a Japanese okay. professional baseball team. Okay. I'm going to say that Larry Doby did play there. And I'm going to say that because I know that a lot of players in the Negro Leagues played a lot of different places to to – to find opportunities. And so that leaves Tony Perez and Goose Gossage. Goose Gossage played for a very long time in the United States. I could, I, I, I don't recall this happening, but I could see him at the end of his career just trying to hang on and play sort of anywhere. And I don't have, I can't, I can't visualize. I just, I can't, I, I just don't see him playing in Japan. So, I think, to be very clear, to make sure I'm answering the question correctly here, Larry Doby played in Japan before he was in the majors. Goose Gossage played in Japan after he was in the majors. And Tony Perez did not play in Japan. That is my that is my instinct. I don't know any of those as facts, but that's that is what I'm going with as my answer. Your answer is correct. Congratulations. Okay. And your your specific information regarding your correct answer is two-thirds correct. Ah, okay. So let's go through this. All right. You just said Larry Doby played before his career. You thought he might have played before his career began for the reasons that that you mentioned. Um, Actually, he did play after his career. Mm. He came over in 1962 and played for the Chunichi Dragons. Mm. Added 225 with 10 home runs and 35 RBIs. Um, Now, I I should mention that I preface this whole question with saying that there have been a number of former and future major leaguers who played in Japan. And of the examples I I gave, um, Alfonso Soriano, interestingly, he played in Japan before, he's one of the more recent players to play there. He played in Japan before his major league career. Now, he played in 1997 with the Hiroshima Carp and would then go on to a a long career in the majors in which he'd hit over 400 home runs. So I would have thought a player like that would have played after his career was, major league career was over, but no, he played before his career began. Um, I mentioned Cecil Fielder, He played for the Toronto Blue Jays, was finding it hard to get much playing time there, went over to Japan, killed it in Japan for two seasons, came over and signed a big contract with the Detroit Tigers and became a star, leading the the majors in home runs, I think, his first two seasons back from after having played in Japan. And that was the case with Goose Gossage. After 18 years in the major leagues, uh, Gossage signed with the Fukuoka Daie Hawks in 1990. Um, but after that season, he returned to the States and would play the final four seasons of his 22-year Hall of Fame major league career 
for the Rangers, A's, and Mariners. So mm -hmm. he was trying to show, look, after 18 years, I still have some gas left in the tank. Showed that he did and played four more years, capping off his 22-year his career with those final four seasons in the majors. Now, Tony Perez did not play in Japan, but the reason I chose him is because his son, Eduardo Perez, who I think a lot of baseball fans know as a color commentator on Major League Baseball broadcasts. Um, in 2001, he played for the subject of today's episode, the Hunchin Tigers. Um, batted 222 with three home runs and 19 RBIs. Where that was in his Major League career, before or after, I'm not sure I believe it was after. Now, one other note I want to make is there were two other Hall of Famers who were involved in Japanese professional baseball, but not as players. In 1975, Hall of Fame pitcher Warren Spahn, he, well, for those who don't know, Warren Spahn has the most lifetime victories for a pitch, for a left-handed pitcher, 363 for Warren Spahn, and he was a pitching coach for the Hiroshima Carp. Now, also, Leo DeRocha, Hall of Fame manager, was hired in 1976 to manage the, and I apologize for my pronunciation here, the Taiheyo Club Lions, but never ended up managing due to health reasons that prevented him from being able to do so. I got to learn a lot about Japanese baseball while I was in Laos with, with Masa. It's it's such a fascinating look at this sport that we love through a different lens. So this has been a really interesting episode for me, and and I appreciate you uh, tying it back to American Major League Baseball because there's obviously you know more and more crossover as uh, this global baseball community continues to grow. Speaking of that crossover, one of the things that I've noticed is on Anna D. Tomaso's Baseball Bucket List podcast. When she asks her final question of all yeah. of her guests, you know, what's left on your baseball bucket list, I've noticed with increased frequency, one of the answers to that question is going to Japan to see Japanese professional baseball. So not only is there interest in those Japanese players coming over to play in our major leagues, but baseball fans are are hearing about Japanese professional baseball and thinking, wow, that looks like something fun, interesting, different, unique. Um, and I want to, I want to check that out. Plus you get to go to Japan, which is on travelers bucket lists uh, in and of itself, baseball or otherwise. And his podcast is going to cost me a lot of money someday and it's totally going to be worth it because I love travel and I love baseball and getting to Japan to see Baseball games there is high on my list, especially going with my friend Masa to a Hanshin Tigers game because that uh, now I have a, a connection to that team and they're they're my adopted Japanese team. So so yeah, I'm gonna find a way to do that. And hey, you and Anna and uh, Ranger Amy and I are every year taking baseball trips. That's our new tradition, and so maybe someday we'll take an international baseball trip. It could be uh, in our future. Let's see what happens. Dan, thank you so much. As always, this is uh, always a ton of fun, and we will talk next week with another Studio Simon Stumper. See ya, Paul.